Well, good morning and welcome to uh, episode two of Light Gear Live, uh, joined by a distinguished panel of guests. Uh, let's welcome Eric Messerschmidt, uh, Danny Gonzalez, uh, Bobby DeCellis, and the venerable Mike Bauman to the, uh, the broadcast. Gentlemen, how are we doing today? Very good. Really good. Thank you. Well, fantastic. Gentlemen, uh, great work. I think uh, it goes without saying that season two was absolutely critically acclaimed, uh, you know, from everything to do with that particular show. I mean, uh, obviously, we're going to talk a lot about cinematography and lighting today, but uh, it's it's a phenomenal project. And I think, you know, um, with, with David Fincher's involvement, uh, you know, and getting this thing out the door and, and the direction and the tone of this, uh, it's just a great project. You know, I just want to make sure that the audience is aware today we're having a, a just a conversation with really good friends and a super creative team. Uh, we are going to allow for questions to come in from the audience. So we'll be, uh, to the best of our ability, Mike and I will be jumping in and trying to ask the team uh, questions just outside of that. So, um, you know, with that, uh, Mike, why don't you start us off? Sounds good. Let's see. Hopefully everyone can see my screen. Yes. Great. Uh, thanks, everyone, for coming today. Um, okay, just going to make sure this is working. All right. Whoops. All right. Good. Good thing is the buttons are working quite nicely. I'm going to go back to the first slide. There we go. Um, well, I just wanted to start this conversation just kind of talking about the relationships that you guys have and, um, and kind of that working philosophy that you've, uh, after doing two seasons of this, how that's developed for all of you. And I know, you know, Eric, you and uh, Danny have been working a lot together, um, especially with David since back in the Gone Girl days. And could you just talk a bit about kind of your guys' working style uh, as a team? And sure. just kind of yeah. the creative inspiration and all that. Yeah, I mean, we, Danny and I have been working together, I don't know, what, like 15 years, something like that. I mean, since we were electricians together and, and 11, 11, 15, 30, whatever. Um, but yeah, a long time. And, uh, you know, and we're also good friends. So, you know, it helps that, you know, that's like pivotal, I think. But, um, you know, I, I think any time you enter into a creative relationship with anybody, uh, in the, certainly in the movie business, like the most important thing is like the, okay, you can get along um, if you're going to spend 80 hours a week with that person um, and that you have some shared sensibility and taste that, you know, you, you develop a, a process of, of, of communication that, that uh, is, is almost nonverbal. You can kind of just, you know, look, look in, um, at, and you're both come to the same conclusion without much discussion. And, and you know, it's been amazing having Danny um, uh, around uh, for that reason, because he, you know, he really, he really understands and he's got great taste. And it's, you know, so that I think for us, it's like, that's fantastic. It, and it's, really helpful, you know, in a show like Mindhunter because it has a very specific look. And and if you know, if we didn't have that relationship, um, it would require so much more dialogue than than uh we have time for. So, you know, it's been it's been amazing for me to have uh guys like Danny and, and Bobby around and um you know, uh helping making the show what it is because it's it is it's not an easy environment necessarily to work in all the time and and, and we um you know, we have to we have to anticipate each other's needs and and, um, and also support the filmmakers. Um, you know, and and David Fincher is somebody that has very specific ideas about how things should look and how things should feel and tone and um, and so uh, you know the, the crew is, is a huge part of that. So um, yeah, it's been you know for us, I think it's been fantastic. Yeah, I think for uh, I mean, if you guys have been working together for eleven years and and uh, you know. I know we've spoken that the show is a very intense uh, environment in a good way, you know, with with everyone really getting on the same page and, and collaborating really well. So I'm sure you guys have developed some great shorthand and some understanding of each other's intuitions and, and you know, uh, feelings for light and things like that. Do, uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, I think, you know, there... oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, like, it's, it's you know we we I think we got to the point um, probably midway through the the first season where Danny and I could go on a on a tech scout and uh, we didn't really have to talk much about what we were going to do because we both kind of knew what we were going to do there you know it's like um, 
we had a we had kind of a method in place and we had an aesthetic that we were we were both going forward something that he and I have worked on together and developed together and um, you know so I think uh, that that's just it just makes the whole process more fun and more interesting when you when you have that kind of relationship yeah and, and like you said a shorthand that's for sure I mean we've, we've been working together I think since 2005 I think is when we first really started working so it's been quite a long time um, and we definitely have that shorthand you know like he said we can scout a location and pretty much have an idea of all the broad strokes uh, and maybe we fine-tune on the day but we have a pretty good idea of what's needed and we'll make some plans and we'll make some plots and then uh fortunately i have bobby who uh will knock out the rig and do a great job and usually i i, I walk into a set that's 90 percent there and we just have to find fine tune the last 10 percent, you know yeah how is the i was curious like how is the because you guys have worked with david uh so much how is the communication with him is it all run through you eric or is david one to you know talk directly danny do you guys dialogue and 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 that kind of thing or how does that all what does that kind of that day-to-day -day workflow look like yeah i mean uh D david will reach for the nearest soldier you know um and yeah. i think you know we 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 know him quite well at this point and we and we we know i mean david has specific visual ideas which is like you know what everybody wants in a director um you want someone that has, has a point of view um and uh, you know, uh, yeah, it, it's uh, you know, and I think that's part of the process is like being on the if if the director has has a visual idea, you you have to roll with it, you got to embrace it, you know. So yeah, absolutely. I mean, I I think um, you know, as far, as far as I'm concerned, you know, David, yeah, absolutely talks to myself or Danny or or through me to Danny or 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 Danny and I present an idea to David, and we you know, or we we work we work on something, and you know, we we have a we have an idea in mind, and sometimes like you know you get in that process of like uh you know you're 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 halfway baking the bread and, and you don't want to taste it yet so you know sometimes danny and i are like developing an idea and we have to present it like you know and uh we show it to david you know um just you know give us 10 minutes and we, we want to show you something and and um and david's amazing like he's unbelievably generous and supportive of that kind of thing you know so um but it's a lot about trust and i think that's part of you know the fact that we've been working together so long is, is we we have that kind of trust trusting relationship where we can, you know, present ideas to each other and there's no risk, you know, I just, I think that in that environment, particularly, uh, you know, Danny and I feel very, very strong and, and comfortable, you know, bringing an idea up and saying, hey, this doesn't work, you know, it happens all the time with Danny, you know, we're lighting something down, you're like, dude, this fucking sucks, like, what are you doing here, man, we had to turn that backlight off and, you know, I go take another look at it, it's like, yeah, man, he's totally right, <laughs> we got to, you know, yeah, yeah I, but I think that's so important to like the film process is when you have people around you you can trust and that can that can push you in certain directions so that you do your best work, you know. And um, anyway, that's right. Yeah, it's very cool. The uh, it's good that there's that back and forth and that dynamic. And I mean, obviously, that's a testament to how long you guys have been working together and, and understanding how. Uh, uh, and I'm sure that you've kind of adapted to kind of what the you guys obviously have a, a feel for what the aesthetics sensibilities are of this production, uh, light levels and all that kind of stuff. And uh, there's a lot of great uh, great ground to cover there. Um, let's see, do we want to what do we have next year? I'm sorry. Um, I guess uh, we wanted. One of the things on this is uh, car process work, and you guys have kind of taken that in a new direction, especially back in Gone Girl, with kind of putting all the video elements into that. And I think there's a lot of great stuff that you've done on this on this series with using car process as a uh, as a way to, uh, you know, whether it's moving or still, which is uh, pretty much do all of your car work on stage is that right that's right yeah um wanted to see if you could talk a bit about kind of some of the working philosophies on some of the car the car process work you know you guys uh have gotten it down sure. to a pretty yeah, pretty lean, sure. mean machine sure yeah well i think you know it's we the mine hunter is a show that has um we, we shoot a lot of coverage and the scenes have a, have a tendency to be quite long. Um, 
even by uh, even by feature standards, there's you know there's it was very often we'd we'd see six, seven, eight page scenes, uh, and and oftentimes in cars. And um, if you've ever been on a process trailer, um, you know how painful that experience can be. And and unfortunately, you know I think the problem with with shooting on a, on a process trailer is that uh, oftentimes all of the elements necessary to make the shot work are antithetical to what you're actually looking for, which is performance, because you're, you know, you're waiting for the cars to clear and you're, you're, you're waiting for the sun to be in the right place and you're, you're waiting for the lock up. And then you have to, you, you only have so much ground to cover because you can only afford to close so much of the street or you can only close the street so frequently or whatever. And, and there's so many factors that go into it. Um, you know, you, you end up walking away from it in most cases, one or two useful takes and, and, and having to cut around certain things. And, and that was something that David really did not uh, want to do. He, he really wanted to take the car scenes and have the opportunity to, to, to sculpt them with the cast and, and spend time. And, and so we, we worked on the system and it, it, it is something that, it's actually something that they had worked on in, on House of Cards and then we expanded on in, uh, on Gone Girl and, and, then, um, and then Danny and I uh, and Bobby um, took a little bit further, I think in season two with, with some of the, the green screen, blue screen, builds that we did and, and massaging the panels. But it's, yeah, essentially what we do is we shoot the plate in advance, we pre-visualize all the camera angles, and then we go in and we just, uh, it's just clockwork. We, you know, we were able to shoot really high page counts um, quite efficiently uh, in that in that one little set. Uh, so, I mean, Danny can elaborate more about the technology behind it, but um, yeah, it worked great for us. Yeah, so Mike, if you go back one screen, uh, just so everybody can see, yeah, that one. Okay, so actually go forward one. Um, so, so yeah, back, like what Eric was saying is, you know, David wants control. He doesn't want to wait on all these resets. And this is a big reason why we do this. So this photo you're looking at here, this is from season one. And in season one, we, we basically had the walls at an angle like this, right? And we had lights above to like the green screen. And then all the panels that you see, the panels we're using, that we have the interactive lighting from the plates that we're feeding into those panels. And so that's how you're getting the interactive lighting on the people. And that's how we light our, uh, our two players. Uh, Mike, if you can skip, or if you can go back one now, uh, other way. So, so then that was season one, this is season two. And the season two, it's hard to tell, you'll see it here. You see how it's a, a dome, like a, a you know, it's, it's curved out like this. So this was a design that uh, Eric and David came up with where they, they had built this in Maya and they figured out how to get this to be a, a flawless, flawless green screen or blue screen. And we did a test in early February with a couple of different shapes, a couple of different sizes. As you can see here, this is our uh, rigging key grip. And so I was out there early with Bobby, just scouting the locations and scouting the stages. And we just did a quick test shoot of uh, one of the uh, panels. And all we did was we took some ribbon, some green LED ribbon. We, we, this is down and dirty, this is not a finished product, but we put it down at the bottom, we put a little bit of diffusion over it, and we just took a quick uh, a couple of photos just to do a test. Uh, it ended up working out extremely well. It was one of the best uh, green or blue screens I think we've ever done. Um, originally, we laid out basically three rows of green ribbon on the top and on the bottom at a slight angle so that it's kind of shooting towards the middle of the uh, cove. You know, the cove is, you know, it's got a pretty good cove and we're basically shooting towards the center there. It, it, it had zero fall off. If you stood in the center of that set and the entire cove was lit up, you'd get vertigo. You would not know where that set ends. And if you walked all the way towards it and you kind of put your hand out, you wouldn't know. You could literally kind of feel like you were going to fall into it because you couldn't tell where it ended. That's a that's a good photo showing you the That's whole. a good photo, yeah. And then this is, yeah, this is a good one showing this you one. with the lights on. Um, but yeah, so that's kind of, that was our design there, you know. So we had LED on the bottom, LED on the top. And at first, the idea was we were going to do green screen. Uh, David and, and, and the post guys prefer the green screen. But so many of our plates ended up having grass or green in the background that we ended up painting it to blue. And then we ended up adding three rows of blue ribbon on the top and the bottom. So we had the ability to go from blue to green if we needed to, but we never really had to. We just shot, I think, 99% of the time, 100% of the time, we shot blue, blue screen, and that was it. Um, and just those three rows of ribbon, top and bottom, was plenty of uh, 
plenty of heat for us. We never needed yeah. any more. Than I mean, we had it dimmed out. That's a good, hold that frame there, Mike. That's a good one, because that's not doctored at all. That's really how it looks, it, you know. Yeah, I mean, um, it's pretty flawless. Uh, yeah. It's pretty flawless. And I think most of the time we had it dimmed down to, you know, maybe 30%. I don't know, something like that, right, Danny? 30% was like the norm. Yeah. Uh, I think there was a couple of times where we shot at a higher stop for uh I can't remember the exact reason, but we did shoot at a higher stop and then we did beef it up. But even then, we were always pretty good. We, we never we never had to like, we never needed more than what we had. We never needed more than what we had. So you guys basically, uh, based off of what you did on season one, had, when it needed something else a little bit more turnkey, because this is basically, you can move this thing wherever and it's gonna stay evenly lit. This is all like collapses and travels and all that kind of stuff yeah it's designed to go into like three shipping containers i mean there's some there's some plaster and stuff and clean up the seams but it's it's pretty uh it's, it's pretty mobile uh, i i don't know where it is right now it's in some storage place somewhere um yeah but yeah that was the idea uh, yeah it's i I, the other, I mean the whole point of it really is to completely eliminate spill um so we were able to we were able to work with a really really low amount of light. Um, and what the cove does is it sort of does two things. It, it helps with the fall off and controls the fall off. And we we, we pre visualized it so we we figured out what radius would work um, the best. And then uh, that's a good one. And then uh, yeah, for a minute. And then we um, and then we figured out we, you know how much how how we could, what the what the distance away was where we could absolutely minimize the spill and and you can see there's there's almost no uh, no blue reflection on the car at all I mean obviously there's some there's the panels are white at the moment but it, it was it was pretty uh, I, I was skeptical to be honest at first when we first worked on we're working on the idea and then you know when we finally got the whole thing built uh, all of us um, in, including David were our jaws just dropped I remember Bobby he's like it's lit it's lit it's lit and me and Danny and and David ran over to the to the blue screen set we saw it and we were all like holy shit it fucking works <laughs> you know and i i don't think any of us really uh were con totally convinced until we saw it done it's now, always good I, to I see also, a plan come together i also want to say like you know this 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 cove setup is very specific to to how david and eric worked you know on my hunter like this might not work for everyone but you know, with, with David, like he had such a specific shot design, like it was gonna work, you know, it was built to work for what he was gonna shoot. So it, it you know, it was, it was, like I said, it was pretty flawless and it was a turnkey operation where, okay, we're turning around, moving cameras to this side, fill that side, bring this side up, so on. You know, yeah, you can see here what... all the panels that we have hanging, we basically have side, side panels, a, a top panel, a rear and a front and then we have all the floater panels that you can see on if you can see them on wheels and on stands in the back and basically we're just putting in those reflections of those plates you know so the driver's side plate the passenger side plate a sky reflection plate uh front plate rear plate and then we use the other the floater panels to fill in any other areas that need either more light or more reflections and we could put whatever plates we wanted to put on those so if we put it maybe in the uh you know front driver's side uh, we could either play the front panel or we could play the side panel, you know, and we could we could adjust the contrast levels of all those uh, of all those video walls and get harder, you know, more stronger reflections or less, you know, as as we'd like. Um, and, and and you can see the grid. Maybe Eric wants to talk about the grid marks uh, for the car, but that that was basically how we line up our cameras. Yeah, we we had we essentially we previous. We, we handed the directors 12, basically 12 angles they could shoot in the car. And and we, the whole show is, you know, it's, it's very much, I think, visually about restraint and and limiting, you know, limiting the target and sort of uh, working within boundaries. And, and, and that's kind of an interesting way to approach something creatively, I think. But, uh, but this is, you know, uh, this is a good example of that. We, you know, we essentially, we had 12, 12 angles, and there aren't really that many places you can put a camera in a car anyway. And we we felt like we we had covered it, and then we able we were able to build a visual style around how the car stuff looks in the in the show to keep it cohesive. But um, but the those angles we would we pre visualize the you know the, the tilt angle, the pan angle, the height of the lens relative to the ground, and and the grid there is is how we register the car in the center of the space, and also how we register the camera so everything lines up. Because the idea is that we want the 
uh, we want the plates to literally drop right in. They're not doing a lot of skewing or dewarping or, or whatever when they do the final comp. It's, it's because we shoot the angle specifically, the plates rather specifically for those camera angles. So it, it makes the post process really streamlined. Um, gotcha. And then of so course we use those plates. So your 12 angles that you guys have determined, you have 12 matching plates at those exact angles, so they just drop right in. Exactly. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's not like we're shooting a panoramic plate and, and then they have to de-warp and scale. You know, it's, it's literally a, a, a drag and drop process for post. Do uh, and, and I, I was curious. I, sent, uh, I think I sent you a, a photo with the plate van, you know, and it's got, you'll see where all the cameras are if, if that's something you wanted to show. I don't know uh, if it's, I don't know. If I don't know if that, that would queued up, but I'll, I'll see if we can do it. might be later down the line, but um, okay. Mike, before we get off this, uh, Danny, Eric, talk a little bit about, obviously these uh, LED walls or these screens, you know, are reflection. That's what they're designed for, right? You're, you're showing plates on those, but here you have them in a white light mode. What CCT was this and what was the quality of that white light? And did you guys find that you could adjust it at all? And did you ever play for it we, in, in white? Yeah, so we, we use the, we're not just using them for reflections, but it's it's this is a, what you're seeing there is is how we lit all the car scenes. We didn't have any extra ancillary light uh, ever. Um, I mean, maybe with the exception of one hard sunlight moment, uh, you know, in the show. But but this is exclusively how we lit it. So uh, we would run the content plates, and then Danny had the ability to add layers of white light or black black layers if we wanted to flag a reflection or or we wanted to animate something. Um, the white point of the screen is, is 6,000 Kelvin. So we, in order to, to achieve, when, when we throw white up on the screen, if we want white, white to register on camera, uh, we, would, we would set the balance to, to 6,000 Kelvin on the camera. Um, and you know, it's, once you deviate from that on the white balance of the camera, all the, the whole color balance of all the reflections shifts and it gets very, very tricky really quickly and you kind of chase your tail. So that was part of our testing process and we did you know, extensive testing obviously. And, um, but yeah, the, you know, I think this is probably just a test frame, but, but we were, I'm sure at this point, Danny, you were probably looking at consistency of the panels and making sure color was, was yeah, clean. And this was just a test. Uh, I don't know if you can see, but there's diffusion. We, we have a, a London fog diffusion that we put in front of the uh, panels themselves about four inches off just to kind of blur it so that you don't see any of the individual pixels and reflections. Um, this, this wasn't for actual lighting purposes. This was just so I could get a photo, honestly. Um, I just had him turn it on all, all to white just so we could take a photo. Um, but, you know, say you had a plate that was maybe too saturated, you could throw a layer of white over that and then just bring down the brightness of that one white layer to be set or, you know, there was lots of things you could do. So we generally had enough stop out of this. We, we were never really like, man, we could use a lot more, but sometimes it, it, we would have liked to have a little bit more. As a gapper, you always want to have more and have the ability to drop down intensity and not worry about having not having enough light but but this worked out pretty well um what yeah, pitch were those the screens uh how five, about millimeter pitch were those do you remember five millimeter five millimeter gotcha and then what did you use to control the uh what a media server or it went through a mbox media server uh and controlled on an ion uh and maybe bobby wants to jump in and Uh, yeah, no, it was, um, we, we, I just want to say we ran all the panels, um, all set lighting, you know, uh, Nick Jones, our board op, um, I wasn't there when they were filming, but he had, you know, total control over the clips and he was able to loop, um, I think even had subtitles for the actors if need be, um, but this was all, all set lighting, um, you know, we, we did it all. Oh, wow. So he could basically do like cue cards, like put the dialogue in yeah. there if necessary. Mm -hmm. that's wow. That's, that's a good fantastic. one. Fantastic. We did. There's, there's. You'll see the the screen. Um, uh, this at the moment the car is facing the camera, but but in most cases the the nose of the car would be looking into the horseshoe, and and there's lots of instances where the where the actors actually have to drive the car, of course, you know, and they have to turn it, and they could look at that forward plate, and they would see um, when the car was turning in the plate, so then the actor knows when to turn the car because we time code sync. Nick Nick Jones would. Um, we, we had a we had a, a register like a blue light in the clip that every time we cue it from the beginning so that the post post production knows where in the timeline the clip is meant to exist so they sync it up because it would, 
what really sells this idea visually is that the reflections in the plate are the same reflections that are in the car. You know, I think that's the that's the big difference here is if you just run content on a loop and then post production doesn't sync that with the with the with the plate in the comp, none of the reflections look real. It looks like yeah. process work. But but in this, you know, when if you watch the show, you'll see that you know the the street lights are are in sync with the reflections and it, it really sells the idea well. And if you really want to see that, the best way to see it is with the night scenes. You know, like in a day scene, it may not be as precise, but in a night scene, if you see a street light go by and you don't see a light reflection or a light, you know, on the actors go by, then we fucked up. But fortunately, I don't think we messed up, you know. So you, you will notice that it, it is synced that way. And as a, as a light goes by in the background, you will see the light, uh, the actors actually light up more. You will see a reflection in, in the windshield or in the car. Wow, that's that's pretty cool. Um, are there any? Uh, I don't know if you want to take a second. Just is there any questions related to this that have been coming from the audience? Uh, I guess the one question that came up from Alvaro is, uh, I think either related to this or related to the overall scope is, what software are you guys using to previs? Oh, um, a variety of things. I mean, everything from uh, we we did models and vector works. Um, we did uh, the, the the ray tracing that that we used for the um, for the wall was done in Maya, um, and uh, and we did some stuff in SketchUp even. Um, you know, so there was a variety of pieces of software involved. And then I've got another question uh, that actually I think it's good that we've got Bobby here as well because this one coming from Jason. Uh, what are the benefits of the style of this green screen? versus uh, the full video wall uh, system that is being used currently on Mandalorian? Oh boy, that's a good well, one. I mean, just costs, you're talking okay. about here. That's <laughs> a couple packs of green LEDs is a lot cheaper than, a, you know, walls and walls of, of, of uh, a video. And the other problem is when you have a uh, video, if you don't have your content ready, you know, you have to sync all that up, kind of like what Eric was just talking about. Um, when it's green, it allows them to mess around and post more. It's a little more forgiving. But if you're shooting the content live, you know, it all has to work together. Yeah, those are two totally different processes. Um, you know, if you're going to shoot into a video wall versus shooting into a green screen. Um, in the interest of full disclosure, Bobby, didn't you rig Mandalorian? <laughs> there you go. Yes, so that's, a, that's an informed voice there. Um, well, I have a bunch of, of uh, screen grabs from some of the, the, the process work that you guys have done. And, you know, and it's all really interesting. And I, but I think one of the things, just as you were talking earlier, kind of about light levels you were working at, um, can you talk a bit about the camera and lenses, just as far as like, what ASA did you sure. guys generally go to? Sure. We, shot, we shot red helium on the second season um, in 8K. Uh, we, we were shooting on Leica Simulus Primes, and we, we kept most of the time we were uh, between a two and a two, a two and a half, uh, was sort of our target stop, and, and that was mostly an aesthetic choice. We, we wanted the, um, I, I wanted the show to feel really consistent in terms of depth of field, and, and you know, sort of so that the, all the interiors felt felt the same, consistent all the way through the whole show. Um, so all this stuff was was really, you know, the assistants would just set the camera to two or two and a third, and, and we wouldn't really touch it the rest of the day. Um, and and I think it helped Danny and I because then we got a real good handle on how much light we needed for every set, and, and we really got used to it, you know. Um, uh, so I I don't know. I think it's probably like twelve to fifteen foot candles on the floor at any time. Danny would know better than I actually because he was the one with a meter most of the time, but. Um, but yeah, and you know, as you can see, the show has a very specific tonal aesthetic. It's kind of like uh, green, yellow, um, cyan kind of kind of look. And all the lighting you guys are doing here was strictly from the panels. You like you, you said, I think you said earlier, they weren't augmenting with anything else. That's right. That's very, right. very, very little, very little. Um, one time we did a uh, some hard sunlight. And we use, you know, an actual Fresnel source. Um, but primarily, it's the pen. There, there were a couple instances where we maybe put a little bit of uh, light ribbon in, in the in the car dash, you know, for a night interior where where we had a really dark plate, you know, and we needed a little bit of consistent light on the on a face as if it was coming from the dashboard itself. But, 
for the most part, yeah, everything was from outside the car. We just, everything's on motors and we just set the heights as, as needed. And, and uh, you know, it was, it was a super automated system. Yeah. We really tried not to use other lighting other than just the plates and the panels, you know. Well, this uh, this next series of um, stills is from episode two. And um, this was really, I thought this was really interesting because you know, most people when they're doing process on stage, it's moving plates. It's, you know, the car is always moving, it's being shaken, all that kind of stuff. But this scene, which is not a small scene, is is all you guys did do this in the in the process environment, but the car it's a truck and the truck is not moving. And it's a conversation with uh the two agents in the front seat and the uh uh and the a person in the back seat. And it, could you talk a little bit about this? Because the choice of the angles, the fact that you could do get away with such a long scene on stage, you know, shooting into plates is is pretty interesting. Sure. Yeah. We um. Well, this was scripted as a, as a dawn, uh, almost pre-dawn scene uh, in a parking garage, and I think it's that I don't know. It's, I think it's eight or nine minutes long. It's, it's a pretty long scene. Um, don't quote me on that. I, I it's been a while. It's but, long. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, and it's elaborate and there's a lot going on and, and you know, um, it, it's, uh, there's a lot of pieces of coverage and, and we looked at it and, and and we did initially discuss if we were to shoot this on location, how would we do it? And David and I talked about it on the phone at length and um, and we decided that, that we would shoot plates because we, you know, there's no way you're going to shoot. I don't know how many pieces of coverage there are. There's probably 15 or 20 shots in here and um, there's no way you're going to get that. Uh, in, in real dawn light and then chasing, changing light and trying to keep it to look consistent would just be a, 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 um, a diminishing return, you know? So we decided to do it on stage. So we took our plate vehicle and we shot all the, we, we lined up all these angles and we rolled um, 10 minutes of plates or 15 minutes of plates at the time of day we wanted. And we went and scouted it and looked at it. And there's actually a shot in the trailer from the exterior. And then the rest of it, yeah, was done on stage uh, with those plates and, and um, you know, this 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 is a scene where 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 um, he, he's sort of uh, interviewing a, a victim of a of a very violent crime, and um, and the guy is, has so much uh, trauma that he he really doesn't want to see his face, um, and so we we didn't want the audience to see his face either, and so we all the camera direction is designed around that idea. Um, I, I I call this scene a masterclass in how to how to shoot a scene. I really. If you haven't seen the scene, I, I highly encourage you to go see it, see it with the sound on, then watch it with the sound off. Um, I think what Eric and David did here with a nine or ten minute scene, uh, make it to make it as interesting as it is, uh, and it all takes place in a car. I think there's a lot of, you know, it's, it's a good buildup of tension. It's the frames are beautiful. Uh, I, I think the lighting works and it's really beautiful. I really do think that this is a master class of how to shoot a scene. Yeah, I thought what was interesting is the one the one moment where I thought you'd see the guy's face, you place that reflection right where yeah. it would, you know, um, and it just, you know, obscures enough of it. So all you're really seeing in his mouth. And uh, that was, uh, yeah, that was good because it was like, oh, great, we're going to finally see the guy. And uh, no. Yeah. There's, yeah, there's a little anecdote here that's a significant part of his character is he was shot in the face. And so you see the um, the scarring that the makeup department did right there on his cheek, and that was what we—that was the, the whole purpose of this. Was mm -hmm. we need to we need to show the audience this scarring, but we we don't want to see his eyes. So you know, that it's like all about placing that reflection in the right place. So I've got two quick audience questions here, um, and both pertain to this uh, particular scene. Uh, one of them is. Um, Brian asks, "Did you guys, when you went out and took the plate van out, did you do any?" additional or augmented lighting or was it all just shot naturally with natural light I totally natural yeah so, yeah and then no the second augmented. question is related to not only this scene but some of the other car work is were any of the cars bucks I mean were were you able to separate the cars in any way did you guys ever utilize that did you pull the glass did you leave the glass in um talk a bit about that if you could yeah sure there, there are instances of cg glass in some in some frames uh places where we couldn't get the reflections exactly where we wanted particularly um it was common in, in uh windshields you know those angles are compound and they get it gets very difficult to get consistent angles especially if you know a lot of those old 70s cars have have little you know 
uh, they have curves along the edges that are, that are really tricky um, to, to get good reflections in. Uh, but we we didn't have bucks per se, but we definitely pulled doors on a regular basis and pulled windows. Yeah. yeah. And we did have another earlier question, uh, and we can talk a little bit of that because I know Mike had touched on the, the camera technology. I mean, you guys switched in season two uh, from 6K helium to 8K. Uh, one of the specific questions is, was with that high of a resolution, was that ever an issue with any of the, the LCD or the video wall panels that you guys were using? Did you guys ever have any concerns with that? No, no. I, I mean, the, the, the 8K sensor, I think, is miles ahead of the 6K sensor in terms of color fidelity and, and, uh, and um, resolution. And we're effectively oversampling at that point. You know, the, the, the finished show is a 4K, is a 4K uh, finish. So we take that 8K that 8K raster and everything gets downscaled, um, and, and it's it, you know you get tremendous benefits out of that. It's just you know it's like oversampling an audio recording. It's the same idea. Gotcha. This uh, just so folks are aware, this is in season two, episode two, is is where this scene take is taking place. Um. Yeah, it's some of the angles and stuff. It just and what's really great about the the system is just you know because you do have with these trucks you have those mirrors out there and uh, you know managing those reflections uh, and you know just the highlights on all the chrome and all that kind of stuff is is really uh, really great stuff. Yeah, was, yeah. So like for for example, in this shot, the 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 plate that is that is uh, any of these, but this is a good example. The the, the plate that's outside his driver's door. That, that's been composited in the in the green screen is the plate on the panel uh, uh, directly outside the car on the stage. So you see that reflection on his on the on the window sill of the door. Um, the, the reason that works so well is because it lines up with the reflection in the plate, and that's just because you know when we when we were there, Danny was able to shift that plate right over where we wanted it and get the reflection where we wanted. Here's a, here's an even better example there. And just also uh, going back to the whole mirrors, you know. Sometimes if we had an issue where, uh, you know, it was seen off into the set, you know, obviously that's a, that's such sheet like a horseshoe. So like the rest of the set, you know, is just black and that's where Video Village would be. So if, if, the mirror, if the mirror was shooting off in the Video Village and we didn't want it to just hit the car and we wanted to try to put something in it, we could always take one of our floater panels and just turn it blue and make that the reflection. And then we could key whatever we wanted, you know, into that, into that mirror. Right. I think there is even instances where we actually put the content plate in the reflection and they didn't even do a, a green screen comp. We actually just used the reflection from the, from the interactive panel. Yeah. If it was out of focus enough, it, it, you know, it totally works. I'll tell you, boys, the amount of questions that are firing in uh, while we're talking about this is phenomenal. It's uh, a bit hard to keep up with, but there's a couple that I think are interesting. Um, regarding your, your plate vehicle, I mean, that, is that a, that's obviously a whole separate unit that's going on, right? It's a plate unit. And are they shooting? Uh, go ahead. No, not necessarily. Go ahead. You finished the question. Sorry, Paul. So uh, with the plates, are you shooting uh, the same 8K helium? Uh, and are you shooting it focused? Or are you defocusing it while you're shooting the plates? OK, yeah, that's a good question. Um, no, it's not necessarily a separate unit. In, in many cases, it was first unit photography because we, we were already on that location for another reason. In most cases, that it, it was done to schedule that um, such that that we could you know we would shoot the plates because all of these scenes correspond with with locations you know these guys are always going or coming from somewhere and, and in, in often cases they were there's a there's an exterior scene that or an establishing shot that we were already shooting um uh the plate photography itself is very fast so we would bring in an assistant familiar with the plate vehicle it had 12 cameras on it um uh that they were gyro stabilized on 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 dji ronin so the plates are already stable. Uh, yeah, we were shooting um, 8K helium on those. Uh, in some cases, uh, Monstro, in other cases, uh, regular uh, weapon body. Uh, but we shot with Canon lenses, and we would set the focus to the corresponding uh, uh, taking lens focus that we had lined up on stage. So for example, this is a 40 millimeter uh, uh, driver's POV is what we would call that. The, the lens here is about four feet from the actor. So we would set the plate focus to four feet. Uh, in this instance, so the bokeh would look appropriate, and all the optics would would look appropriate and when the. I just want to mention, because uh, like like he said, we we would shoot plates sometimes right after filming, which made the uh, 
which made the lighting and the rigging of lighting uh, have to be very uh, like stealth mode and ninja like, you know, so like usually you have cable running everywhere and distro boxes piled up and gags stored over here and lights staged over there on any of these sets and specifically to any pincher set. You just don't want to have all that stuff laying around. You, do, you don't want to have that just in the visual uh, sight lines. So everything had to be hidden pretty well and all the cable had to be laid out super discreetly and, and super neat uh, so that when we finished that set, we could brush away all the first unit lighting, we could clear stuff out and the plate bands could roll through and record. If they saw any of that cable or any of that distro or any of that stuff, any of that film production stuff, you know, we, he would go on a war path and I would get in trouble or, or you know, we get yelled at. <laughs> so everything had to be super uh, neatly done. And that's a testament to Bobby's work. You know, he, uh, he crushed it and did a great job. Everything was always hidden uh, as far as set lighting yeah. and those, uh, we never were in the, in the sight lines, you know. Bobby, to tell us you're, you're a magician, man. He's amazing. Yeah. Bobby, talk uh, about that. I mean, what well, kind of pressure... You. What kind of pressure does that put on you and your team, knowing that you know that you've got to hide as much as you possibly can? I mean, how does that change your approach to other shows you've rigged? Um, you know, uh, so I was the new guy on the on the on the block here. You know, Danny and Eric and had all worked together with David, and I I hadn't, so they warned me. Um, you know, I, I tend to rig like a minimalist. You know, it's usually whatever the gaffer wants, but uh, you know, less is more. Um, fun fact about this scene though is um. My friend got married and I was in the wedding party, so I had to leave. I missed the day we rigged this and my best boy rigged it and I walked him through it and the art director showed up, who was a very nice man, and told him to rig a different floor. So I got a call from the UPM on Sunday that the cable was in the shot and he had to move it. And then I, my flight got delayed, so I actually drove over there at like two in the morning um, once my flight landed to, to make sure it was all ready for him because, uh, yeah, hell hath no fury like yeah. David Fincher. So yeah, that, you know, that's that's a, a good example because a, a scene like that, right, where all they were doing was going to this parking garage to shoot plates. There really wasn't any set lighting to be done other than power and video village. If anybody needed power, that's really all I had to do, right? So if David showed up and all of a sudden there's gag and distro and all this stuff run, he's just gonna go on a warpath. Like, why the hell is this stuff here? We don't need this. So you know, for that, for that specific scene we had power below and above this the this the actual floor of the uh, garage that we were shooting just so that we could power stuff and i had a couple of sky panels standing by in case something happened and we needed to do something but otherwise it was just available light and just some courtesy power and then this was really the only thing you shot on the location right uh just these establishing shots like this kind of thing the entrances and exits and all that that's right that's yeah. right. We, we ran we we ran the entire scene so that the uh, uh, so so that we could cut away out to the wide shot at any point. You know, in the in the edit in the end in the end they didn't end up doing that in in the cut, but but we did uh, protect the edit that way. Gotcha. Wow. Good stuff. Um, I guess the the other question somebody had uh, had mentioned which I think is interesting and is, is just using RGB light source, which a video wall is, it, you know, uses how the light quality, of, not that so much the quality, but the, the color fidelity of RGB. How did that, how, how did you guys manage that? Well, that's, that's um, part of the reason why we, we rated the camera at, at 6,000 Kelvin. I think when there are obviously compromises you make re related to CRI, you know, in the, in that situation, but the, um, you know, the camera is only seeing RGB as well, which people have a tendency to forget. The spectral sensitivity, the sensitivity of the camera is wide enough to, to manage it uh, itself in that in that instance. But but uh, you know, there there are uh, absolutely compromises that are made. But but by putting the camera at that at that um, at that color balance, and then um, you know, sort of restricting our our palette such that we're we're not really we're not looking for uh, those. Uh, those magenta red tones that are absent anyway, where, you know, we were able to kind of make it work. And I, I think it's, you know, it's, it's, it's not perfect, but it, we, it's definitely miles, miles beyond where we were on Gone Girl and, and, and where they were on House of Cards. And, and we've, you know, we've come a long way. Gotcha. I think we have a clip. And in fact, in this scene right here, Danny asked, I'll never forget, 
Danny asked me if we could put a brighter bulb in a street light. And I remember thinking to myself, I've never been asked that question. I don't know if you can do that. <laughs> and the answer was a resounding yes. Um, they actually changed out the 70 watt bulbs in the street lights to 400 waters. And the residents oh. liked it so much, they left them in. Gotcha. Well, I think <laughs> that, I was going to say that because one of the things, and Danny provided these maps, which I remember you saying uh, for this night exterior that you guys didn't even really, for the content you shot, was a lot of it was just you lit so much in a large area, mainly also for plates too. Is that not just for the right. scene, but yeah. also just to do plate passes? Yeah. Right. This and, is, uh, yeah, this scene specifically, we there the only camera uh, angles are, are two little up in the top left corner. We had two little the, the two little shots, and the rest is all plate plate driving through the streets at night. So, um, yeah, yeah, it was just lighting and, uh, a large area for for a scene that is uh, you know a driving scene at night in the Atlanta streets. Um, uh, but yeah, most of it was for plates, and uh, yeah, there was I think two shots, like he said, where some kids cross the street and you shoot, you know, you shot some some of that. But we had a lot going on there, a lot of fixtures, a lot of practicals that we added. I think four condors. Um, it was just a big, large area that we lit. We also yeah, we had a really we had a really supportive locations department too, which they deserve some credit. They really helped yeah. us out, and, and um, yeah. yeah, and and I think they you know made our our lives easier. I definitely ask for everything uh, from locations and from from set deck, uh, and I, I got I got a lot of what I asked for. So I mean, huge shout out to to both of those departments because they they uh, they really helped out. And this was a this was a huge rig, and Bobby Bobby crushed it. It was a uh, was fantastic. You know, I walked in to pre light this uh, the day before. It was really good. I walked in and, and there wasn't too much left for me to do. Um, and then when the uh, when the when the first unit crew came in to shoot on the day, you know, I think David and I and Eric hopped in the plate van and we took a spin and they pointed out some things to to fix and tweak and we tweaked that. And otherwise, it was it was pretty dialed in. You can see, you know, the detail of, of Danny's um, notes here is 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 amazing but it's exemplary of like a show where i think communication was huge and you know we had a big thing it was like you know fix it in press um yeah you know i mean i've never gotten detailed drawings like this from a gaffer this was amazing for me it actually feels like cheating <laughs> you know because <laughs> um, it was like oh all i have to do is what danny told me you know so many times you know especially older gaffers I used to work for, it was kind of like an idea. They didn't tell you what they wanted. They just like, well, put some stuff over there and some stuff over there. But getting this kind of level of notes from Danny was, it, it, I couldn't have done the job without without this. It made it really easy. Well, it certainly speaks to, uh, you know, the use of practicals and and putting practicals in frame because it's as, as a light source and as a highlight. And it's just, you know, be able to have a great location department and a supportive set deck. Uh, department is man that is a huge impact on the photography yeah absolutely yeah this, yeah yeah in this I, specifically we did place a, a street lamp yeah this is a perfect one so if you see at the, the far left edge where uh it says existing cobra head and then all the way to the right another existing cobra head so i just measured that in google and halfway in the middle i asked them to put in a uh, a lamp post you know a street light and so our department did, they brought in a, a lamp post and we put in a 400 watt sodium vapor overhead. And that gave us at least a little more continuity since the car was going to be driving through, you know, three, 400 feet worth of area that didn't have any kind of, uh, there was no house. You know, it, it'd be one thing if there was a building back there that we could have lit and motivated, maybe put some lights in the background, but all there was was trees. So the, the car's just going to drive by basically black at night. Those trees are just going to be black. So we asked if we could have a street light. They said yes, and that you know that was a huge uh, game changer that saved us having that there. Yeah, and it, it's not just a lamppost; it's a fucking telephone pole. <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah, it wasn't something out of a shot. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, it's are a those, great segue. Oh, go ahead. I was just going to ask because I'm I'm looking at a question from the audience. Are those actual sodium vapors? Uh, is that what you guys were using in the Cobra heads? Yeah. yeah. And then were you doing any augmenting day of, Danny, with uh, any sodium vapor gel or any type of uh, additional color to try to match that? 
Yeah, we did. We uh, the color pack that we would use was half straw, half green uh, on an incandescent light. So if I was using incandescent, I'd use half straw, half green, or half straw quarter green, um, and that would be the color that we would go for for sodium vapor. We tested a bunch, uh, season one and season two, a bunch of different gels for for sodium vapor looks, and we found a lot of the actual sodium vapor type gels that are labeled sodium vapor, urban vapor, or chocolate, or whatever, to be a little bit too rich. And so we just went with some uh, some straw and some green, and we liked that. It was a little more subtle. It was better on the, the skin tones, um, and we went with that. So that kind of became our standard color pack for sodium vapor. If we were doing, uh, if I was using a sky panel or an LED, then I would just, you know, find a color. We, we, we kind of dialed in a color on sky panels that we liked for our sodium vapor uh, look. And just so folks understand, a cobra head is basically a, a, another what's what we call street lights, uh, old school street lights. They are uh, uh, it, certainly for this period, because the period you guys are in too. I mean, I imagine there's there were environments maybe you were in there. It swapped a lot of street lights out for LED, so it's always important to go back to what's the period. Yeah. Um, but just as a segue into talking about practicals and fixtures and some of the uses you guys have. Uh, that you you know in the frames and I just took a bunch of different frame grabs of, of scenes throughout season two of just kind of some of your use of of uh, you know practicals and and uh, to to achieve separation to you know uh, to get some life going on in the back of the frame you know I can imagine you have a lot of conversations with the onset dresser about setting the correct heights for practicals depending on the frame and things like that hey move that down a few inches take that up that kind of thing. Oh yeah, yeah. We we had Nikolai Lovakis, uh, who's probably I mean he's the best onset dresser I've ever worked with, hands down. He's amazing, and 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 he was always right next to Danny or I or at the monitor with David, and you know, and and he's one of those people that just injects himself in the conversation. He's like, oh, let me move that up a couple inches, or I think we should move that right. Is that where the camera's going to be? We can put that practical over here. And he was always so involved in the process, and it's amazing having somebody like that in that role because it, it just adds so much and, and it's so helpful um yeah. but yeah it's absolutely practical placement is huge and um you know a lot you know in most cases we would go out there and we would pre-visualize these angles and we knew uh, this is a good example that we um we were trying to figure out how to light this bar and steve arnold and danny and i were looking i was like what if we just if we just put a whole shitload of light bulbs up there <laughs> and let it be this kind of like yeah. cool you know um and I think we did some sort of like cover or something, right, Danny? We like did something so that it went up and like a, a pie dish behind it, so that yeah. it was lighting the wall, just kind of kicking back towards towards us, you know. It was literally yeah. made up of some aluminum tin. Yeah, you know? this is a pretty impressive set that that Bobby and the guys raised because it was this was quite a large set on stage, and it had lots of layers and neon and and light bulbs and and almost everything in here. We maybe hung a light mat or, or two, but for the most part, everything was lit with, with practical. Yeah, this set this set was the uh, the command post bar, and it's uh, it's practical city, man. I wish we had more shots. I don't know if we do, but it's literally you know there's cracks on the walls, cracks on tables, cracks everywhere, neon signs, all sorts of other signs. It was practical city, and the cool thing is all those bulbs you're looking at right there, they're LED, and it was a fantastic LED bulb, like. We tested, and I couldn't believe how good these were. Uh, the color was great. Uh, the dimming was outstanding. And I hadn't found a, a, an LED bulb that dimmed really as well as these. Like, we tested, and we were blown away. So uh, we talked to the uh, to the art director and production designer, and we were like, hey, can we get, we like this bulb. Can you get, I forget how many, hundreds of yeah. them. Can you get hundreds of them? And he went out and got them all, and and that's you know that's primarily what's on that set is those LED bulbs are really nice. Yeah, the well, ceiling, the ceiling is a, it's a, it's meant to be a tin ceiling, but they for money reasons they had to build it out of pressed plastic, so we couldn't put like a 25 watt light bulb up there because it would melt it. So that's why we went that direction. Yeah, and you have I mean you have atmosphere in here too, so that kind of broad source with all those those uh, light bulbs certainly helps glow that too and get you some separation and stuff. It's really yeah. nice. Yeah, thank you. From a rigging standpoint, Bobby, I mean, you know, with, with a very practical heavy show, how do you adjust your approach both on, you know, getting wires in, getting control and dimmability of, of those practicals? And, you know, do you look for different crew members that have different skill sets than maybe you would on a different style of show? Um, 
so yeah, you know, uh, touching back on what Eric said, you know, it's all done in prep, you know, uh, you know, talking with the art department, being their friends. I think I bug Steve Arnold, the production designer, all the time. <laughs> I was always around him, buzzing around, asking questions. Um, but yeah, no, it definitely changed your skill set. Unfortunately, when you're out of town, you know, you you have a, a more of a finite pool. Uh, had we been in Los Angeles, it would have been a lot different. You know, it's a lot of times you're just it's not that the people are bad. They just have, don't have as much experience. So um, I actually really didn't know how to solder when I started this show. And uh, no one knew how to solder in Pittsburgh. So I, I got really good at soldering. <laughs> <laughs> Trial by fire. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, that's, that's the key to it all. You know, I try to do as a manager is that I try to have as many skills as possible. So when I go somewhere, whatever skills are lacking in my crew, I can kind of fill in the gaps. You know, so if I had some solders, you know, I would have been doing something else. But, uh, you know, you just kind of got to find everybody where they work and move them around until it works out for you. And I just want to mention again about uh, our on-set dresser, Nikolai, like having somebody like that on set who is not just, you know, a guy who's, uh, I need a piece of furniture to move, can you move that? You know, he's not that guy. Like Nikolai's paying attention. He's looking at the frame and he's making it better, you know, and that's yeah. something David wants. That's something Eric wants. That's something we all want is we're all collaborating on how do we make this better? You know, like, is it better if we just turn this light off? Is it better if we move this light up two inches? Is it better if we slide this left, you know, and we're all trying to make the frame better. And I think that's, that's part of what, why we take pride in this, in this show that we work on is we were all really, you know, trying to do the best we could for a guy who accepts only perfection, you know? Yeah, I, I think that's a really important point. Like, I, you know, David David creates an environment on the set where um, uh, everyone is really free. I think if they have an idea that is valid, that they can present, that they have the opportunity to present the idea, and everyone is under um, the expectation to improve the shot any way they can. You know, so so it's it's great to be in that situation. That you know, that not not just be, have people that are energized to improve the shot, but also have the environment where that that's the, that's the expectation in, in every instance. You know, and it's it it is definitely part of the part of the shooting environment we were in. Yeah, I was curious. Do you is it like some of these sets? You obviously have scouted them and, and done previs on some of these, but like a scene like like some of these shots. I'm assuming most of the are you just taking what starting with the base level of what the practicals and the practical kind of plan you guys have executed, and then just adjusting. Uh, you know, whether it's fill sources from there or additional keys and that kind of thing, with kind of taking the cue from the practicals. Yeah, generally we, I mean, we, I think we approached it from a motivated light standpoint and we always scouted and, you know, the, the first thing, like when David and I go scout a location, uh, you know, we go stand and look in the direction of where, what we want in the background and then figure out how we're going to put the actors in front of that, that background, you know, at least contextually within thematically what's happening in the scene. But, um, but yeah, but from a lighting standpoint, it was, it was generally like, let's, let's see what our baseline is. Okay. Turn everything by, behind us off. And then, uh, and then we'll add just the bare minimum. Well, I definitely can uh, jump in and say that you guys are gonna be receiving tons of questions and or hate mail if you don't find out the name of that light bulb because <laughs> it, it, it's uh, if I could only count the number of people who wanna know specifically what that dimmable LED bulb is. So uh, maybe if I we believe, don't find it. I believe it was a Westinghouse bulb. Uh, I believe it was Westinghouse and I, I believe it was like a 25 watt or 40 watt equivalent, but maybe Bobby can find it or maybe we can search it down. Hey, yeah, my phone is, uh, sorry, I just want to hold this frame for a sec, continue, but this is a set we're talking about here. Well, I'll just, yeah, I was go just going to cap it with, uh, if we find out the lamp, uh, Mike or I will get it posted on one of the Like Your Social channels uh, so that, you know, we're not getting uh, mail showing up to either of our guests' homes. Oh, real quick, while we're still while we're still talking about that bulb, uh, you know that was also uh, that was 2018. So there, you know, there, there might be better options better now. now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There yeah, might yeah. be better options now. That was 2018. So just uh, another heads up. This this set is uh, this is this is a set that we built. It's it's quite an elaborate one. It's the lobby of. of of a hotel um, that was built inside an old mall that was uh, almost completely decommissioned. And Bobby and his team and Danny just did incredible work here. It's, it's, it's pretty spectacular. Said it's 
this isn't the best frame necessarily to, to show you the full extent of it, but it's a huge, it was a huge set and a huge undertaking um, with, with quite, a, quite a lot of elaborate stuff going on in it. Um, again, heavily practically motivated, obviously, but, but it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty impressive stuff those guys put together. Uh, yeah, I think we have some, uh, well, and also in the area of like large top sources, which is uh, you know, coming up, uh, I think we've got some other shots of it. Uh, this night uh, exterior in the forest, uh, you know, heavy flashlight motivation. Uh, I think you guys had some maxi roots deep in the background, lighting the smoke. Was that kind of it? If I remember correctly. That's it. Yeah, yeah. We had those. I don't know. How, I don't not remember how many they were, but it was all. You know, we. I, I hate it. I think it looks really weird when you have when you have high top light or you know condor lit backlight through it through a forest. I always think it looks a little bit fake. So. We were lucky this location had a road along the side and and, and we could run maxi brutes along and, and and light the smoke and side light the trees. So yeah, this was, uh, you know, we called this Red Wine Road. And the idea was on the street, there were a bunch of police vehicles and a fire truck. And so like we wanted to motivate from the headlights of the cars. And so the idea was we put, you know, some smoke in the background, some fog, atmosphere, and then we would just light that. So I had, I want to say somewhere between 10 and 12 maxis on the street uh, lighting that up. And then we also had a ton. This was a set that I had Bobby put in quite a lot of lighting. There's, there was a ton here. Um, we had blondes, probably 30 blondes from Malibu's and a bunch of uh, mini nines deep as well and some gem balls. I mean, we had a lot of stuff here. Uh, um, but the primary uh, source was really those uh, those maxi brutes uh, lighting the fog and then the flashlights. What did you guys have inside the flashlights? Do you remember? They're, they're, just, they're just regular. Uh, yeah, they're regular. Gotcha. I think, you know, I think the camera here, we put it, there's so much tungsten light, and um, but we wanted this to feel very cool and desaturated. So I think the camera is at 2800 Kelvin in this scene. Oh, wow. So we're, that's how we're able to get that real crisp light and out of the, you know, it was important. All the all the props, by the way, are period. Um, so they, you know, we didn't do any augmentation there. So that, you know, these are, these, I, I think these are just traditional mag lights. Gotcha. Well, just to talk a bit about like kind of the use of top light and some of the kind of like your, the lar you know, your, your general ambience and soft sources and things like that. Cause I know in our conversations before this is just, you know, you'd mentioned, you know, that top light was a big, a big factor in some of the stuff you guys are doing. And this seems, this is the, the ambient box you built outside the, uh, on, this is a stage, right? That's right. Yeah. That's outside the Tench house. So that's for the, that's for the backyard of the Tench house. Um, it was on motor so we could lower it and we could angle it as needed. Um, I think we had 18 or 20 mirage in there i can't remember exactly i think i don't think it was even 20 i think it was 16 or 18 something weird like that 18 i think it was 18. um i wanted more you couldn't afford more so so that's what was in there <laughs> yeah it was gotcha. barely enough light it was just barely enough and then this is quantic uh i think that other photo was from quantico oh yeah I could yeah, that's, be. A different box. that's from the atrium in Quantico, in the Quantico set. But that's the same engine that you had in the other boxes. Same right. engine. That's it. Yeah, yeah. So let me uh, um, jump in here because well, I know we're going to get questions as we go through this. Uh, for those of you who don't know Mirage, Mirage is a rental product uh, that we have at Lightgear, uh, originally designed as an LED retrofit for the Image 80 product. Um, and in this case, obviously, they're, they're using them as just the bare light engine, but inside that, is 400 watts of tungsten daylight, visual effects blue and visual effects green. Uh, so in this particular application, I think as, as we were working with, you know, Eric and Danny and the team and, uh, on this, it's, it's a very shallow light source. So it allows the box that Bobby built to be very small and, and quite shallow. Um, but at 400 watts, it's a lot of output. It's very, very wide. Um, and I think, you know, the one thing that maybe, uh, Eric, you can talk to a little bit is by having the green, you didn't necessarily use it like we were thinking to light the green screens or blue screens, but you were actually mixing in some of the color to just adjust the palette as you guys were playing with the white light. That's right. Yeah, we, we felt that the show has, has a little bit of a green tinge, some, some say, uh, 
some of us argue that it it looks natural and, and because we hate magenta but um <laughs> uh, you know the uh the um we found that the tungsten the tungsten emitters just that tended actually to shift slightly magenta so we would use the green the green emitter in, in the light engine to offset that a little bit i don't think danny had it up a lot i think it was five or three or five percent or something but um but yeah, also so, i i think that you know the diffusion material also has a tendency to kind of to warm it up a little bit and shift the color slightly so yeah we uh we prick we we kind of like added eight or quarter green to just about every LED light that we use on the show. Um, we, we primarily like almost always had a little bit of green on everything for the most part. Like we used a lot of uh, cool white or warm white fluorescent tubes and we embraced the green from that. So then when we would bring in pictures, we would add eight or quarter green to almost everything. So this light having the green and the blue was great for us because we always add a little bit of green with it. and there were times when we took it up to 10,000 Kelvin, which we were able to do because we had the blue diode, you know? So instead of maxing out at 56 or 65 or whatever, you know, your cool white, your, your daylight uh, Kelvin is, we were able to take it to 10,000 Kelvin and we did stuff like that, you know? And we always had the ability to add a little bit of green. Yeah. yeah. But fun fact, um, even when we were completely out of money and the UPM said I couldn't have anything, he, he said there was always money for green gel. For Fincher. That was the one I always thought about, no matter what. <laughs> no magenta on set. No magenta. Um, this I thought this, this is uh, this yeah, here, Mike. Sorry, this this is a this is a church, uh this is there's like a community meeting scene in the in the show and uh this was pretty tricky. I think we, we didn't have a ton of rigging options here. Uh, yeah, there's a there's a good a good example. This we um we ripped off Harris the Vidis here. There's there's a scene in um in a film uh, he shot that, that I was I was borrowing um, I was borrowing aesthetically for this, but uh, yeah, I think it worked out really well. Bobby, so can that's you talk about challenges of the the rigging on this. Um, you know, there's a lot of old buildings, so you know um, everything has to work when you get in there. I changed out probably half the ballast in Pittsburgh. Uh, I had this great um, electrician named Don that basically became another one of my. He was he wasn't a uh, set lighting; he was a real electrician. But he basically was with me on every set. Um, you know, he'd come in and help me. He was like an extra set of hands. Um, uh, you know, it was just old buildings. Um, one ballast only had one wire going to it. I'd never seen that before. <laughs> one hot wire. Um, but wow. yeah, it was, you never, it's like, you know, you never quite knew what you were going to get when you opened up that box. And um, Eric, and you had mentioned, yeah. Eric, you mentioned, you know, sometimes with a lot of your guys' coverage plan that using, you know, a soft ambient top light is a is a good baseline uh, that combined with practicals as far as like getting coverage. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, we the the show. There's a lot. Of, there's a lot of these scenes are pretty complex and they're dialogue driven, and so we we had lots of pieces of coverage. And as much as I think Danny and I would look at a scene and wish we could put a light on the floor and put some more shape into it. It, it, it was in some time, sometimes antithetical to the, the idea of, of trying to stay truly motivated with the, you know, in terms of lighting direction that we would establish in a master shot or, or in the bulk of the coverage in the scene. So we were, I, I was very hesitant to, to, to cheat lighting. And, and so, you know, the second you start putting lights on the floor and, and relighting pieces of coverage, covers, it, it starts, the continuity starts, I, I think the audience sees past it a bit in, in many cases, you know, in complex scenes. So, so the top light, helps with that just logistically. Um, and it also kind of became an aesthetic choice for us. You know, a lot of our references looked just like this. So it, um, you know, something we were trying to embrace and, and also, you know, naturalism, of course. Um, what what CCT were you guys uh, staying at on the soft boxes, on the overheads? I mean, was it pretty consistent across all the different large overheads? It just, it just depended, if, obviously, day or night. I mean, you know, if we were gonna do a day scene, uh, we were probably at 56 or 6,000. If it's a night scene incandescent, then we might be at 3,000 Kelvin. Um, but we would we fluctuate in between, you know. Uh, I'd say those were our two kind of like base, and then we fluctuate in between. Yeah, we did. I didn't do any. There's no creative LUTs or anything on the monitor. There's no there's no show LUT for this show. There was there was no live color. Uh, the one thing we did do sometimes to influence color in, in dailies uh, and then down the line was was we would manipulate the color on the on the camera. So. 
I think our typically we'd be around 4,000 Kelvin, 4,200 Kelvin on the camera for your for your typical day interior and, and maybe 3,000 for an interior. But I, we would shift that and shift the tint in the camera just to influence the grade slightly um, so that so that the dailies would reflect what we were trying to accomplish. No, it's interesting. I think, you know, just going back to something you were talking about earlier, Eric, I mean, you and David and the team clearly set a tone, right? A look for how this show was going to to, to go throughout the course of the season, but then you bring in different directors. You've got at least two more directors that came in for other blocks. How did you make sure that you maintained that same aesthetic over all of the different blocks? And did you ever have pushback or difficult conversations where you're like, boys, we can't really do that? Well, it's tricky. You know, I, that's, I think that's the, that's the challenge every episodic TV DP faces. You know, you're sort of, you, you have an obligation to, uh, protect the show and protect the the, the aesthetic um, stylistic choices you've made in the show because you, the show needs to exist as as especially this one I think has to exist as a as a complete unit. Um, but also, you know, the the directors have a responsibility to bring their own sensibility to the to the episodes they're directing, and and that's why they've been hired. So you're kind of like, you know, I I think every director comes into it um, with fresh eyes and they look at it and they have ideas and and it's the DP's job to, um, and the crew's job in general to to help them achieve what they're trying to do within the spec of, of the of the show. And you know, it's not always easy. And and uh, you know, we don't say no to directors. That was very clear from you know from day one with with David. You, you know, you never say I'm not doing that for you. But but we did definitely uh, use examples of what we've done in the past. You know, and also what happens a little bit on, on shows is you you know, you might establish something in episode five that you have to carry on into episode eight with another director. So it's, you know, um, the directors have a responsibility to look forward in the script and in the story to, to make sure that the, the things they're setting tone-wise or aesthetically uh, will work in the future down the road. And, and you know, it's just it's just part of the job, I think. It's, it's an interesting and challenging part of the job, but it, it's, it's much different from features. You know, in features, you are wholly responsible for the director's vision and, and you, you know, the job is, is, I think, a lot more clear. Um, but yeah, I mean, the show is challenging in that way because it, it has such a specific look. Yeah, I mean, again, along these lines, um, you know, Eric, I don't know, if you, I'm sure you remember the tone meeting we had with Eric, with uh, with David. You know, he essentially deputized us all and, and basically said, you know, you guys are all in charge of your departments and, and you're in charge of the show. You're in charge of how things look. So he was essentially saying, like, if something doesn't look right, if something, whether it's an actor, a background actor, a costume, a practical, a set, or something, 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 you guys all need to get onto each other and fix it, and and you all need to be responsible for the look of the show. It's not just gonna be, you know, the, the top of the line. It comes from all of us, and I thought that was really cool. He was basically kind of deputizing us, saying, yeah. you know, make sure everything that goes on screen is what it should be. Is 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 you know. As perfect as it can be. Yeah, I think it's it's really important that it's clear. I mean, David has a reputation for being very specific, but but he also is unbelievably generous and trusting and and supportive of the people around mm -hmm. him. And you know, we we were definitely um, given a tremendous amount of, of room to 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 make decisions on the show's behalf. And, and uh, you know, we we're just fortunate to have good people around that that could take it um, in the right way. I think, but but that's. You know, he he was unbelievably um, supportive and, and open to to those ideas and making sure that everyone was was also in a position to take their own responsibility. We're getting near the end. Uh, I just wanted to focus on one last thing, which is kind of like I just it has his eyes and flares, and and really talking about a bit about how you're kind of handling. You know, obviously, you guys you mentioned earlier doing uh, uh, digital. Um, uh, flares for some of the some of the highlights and stuff and just kind of what the this is obviously a little extreme looks like the space shuttle's landing I just caught the right frame I guess <laughs> uh, um, I, you know I was just curious kind of like where you know is the use of flare how does that sure your thoughts and all that kind of stuff yeah sure well I mean we you know we wanted we we responded to um, certain aspects of the anamorphic photography of the 70s and um, 
you know, we like certain, David and I like qualities of that, but uh, we didn't want to shoot anamorphic for, for a variety of reasons, mostly because anamorphic is, uh, presents all sorts of problems that were antithetical to the way we our coverage design, basically. We wanted to use wide lenses close. We wanted to minimize depth of field. Uh, we wanted a variety of focal length options. Um, and, and unfortunately with anamorphic, that um, uh, is, is, it becomes very difficult. Um, particularly the close focus issue, but also, you know, the, the lenses, it's very difficult to get consistent matching sets of the anamorphic lenses. And, mm -hmm. and we wanted to be able to, to really predict how they were going to behave. So we shot spherically and, um, and we shot on Leicas, which are fantastic lenses. And one of their qualities is that they're nearly impossible to flare. So um, <laughs> we, what we did is, is we, we took all of the existing uh, highlights in the frame and, and when it was appropriate we did we did the flares digitally which was fantastic for me because we could go in in the in the di process and and communicate uh back and forth with with a with an artist and say a uh, little bit more magenta here a little bit less green here you can see in this frame this is a this is a um a still uh you know photo strobe that that we've added flare to it and you see the, the chromatic aberration there on the left which is something that happens naturally in an optic but but uh, is entirely painted in, and that's something that we art directed. David and I art directed all the flares, uh, you know, with the assistance um, of, of the post department, obviously. And you know, that's a really amazing um, process to go through, and and something I think is is really fun because you, you you get to art direct the flare exactly as you want it, which we you know we just don't get to do if you do it naturally, you know. I do have a question yeah. from an audience member. Uh, Ryan asks, uh, what focal lengths did you guys carry for the show? And then how many sets? We had two sets. Uh, well, we had one complete set of Leicas, which I think is, is 10 or 12 lenses. Um, and then we had uh, duplicates of our most common focal lengths. For the most part, the show is shot on the 29, the 40, and the 65 millimeter prime. Um, and then we, we did use the 25 uh, fairly often, but the 21, the 18, the 75, and the 100, uh, I, I can count on one hand the number of times we use those lenses. So yeah, it's pretty much those four focal lengths for the whole show. This this is a 65 here. Yeah, I was curious, like just real quick, like your you guys' thoughts on highlights and things like that, because you know it's just it's definitely subtle as far as we're using them in certain situations and things like that. Sure. Well, I've seen three days of the Condor. With on Reisman shot and, and yeah. he's really aggressive. Uh, oh, nice yeah, bright highlights. Um, and, uh, you know, that, that movie felt appropriate to the period. And, um, and also Clute, I think, is, is, a, is a good reference for the show. And, um, and uh, Peter Bezu's work in, in Mississippi Burning. And, and in all three of those movies, you know, there's, there's this kind of uh, a thing that, was, that those guys were doing where they were, they were using hard, hard front highlights, um, which which we, we duplicated. Danny built a thing we called the puck, which was actually an LED, it's a soft light, but it's small. It's maybe that big, the size of a hockey puck, and we used it quite a bit for highlights. And, you know, part of the thing I think you can get away with is, is if you have um, an actor's face, you know, two or three stops under, um, if, you add, if you add a bright highlight into the eyes, uh, the audience forgives the underexposure. <laughs> so we would cheat a little bit, you know, um, in that way, and, and it was a, it was a good opportunity for us to take it a little darker than, than maybe uh, our, our normal comfort level would allow. Yeah, gotcha. That's great. Um, Paul, are there any closing questions from anyone? Well, I think you guys have done an amazing job. I I, I know uh, one of the things that I like to always close in and talking about is what are you guys doing next? Uh, I mean, Eric and Danny, you guys just figured or uh, finished up another project with David. Uh, do you want to just gingerly touch on that and tell us a little bit of what you can can tell us? Sure. Yeah, we just we just wrapped a movie uh, called Mank uh, for Netflix. It's a, it's a black and white film, period film, um, uh, centered around uh, part of the story of the telling of Citizen Kane. Uh, and yeah, and we shot it in black and white. So it's I think a really awesome creative challenge for Danny and I. Um, I certainly hadn't done anything like it before and, and it was, yeah, it was pretty, pretty exciting, pretty fun project for us. I can only yeah, imagine yeah. The, the difference in lighting styles, you know, to, to go from Mindhunter, like the way it's, it looks to something like Mank, which is black and white, which is obviously going to have a lot of contrast. Yeah, quite drastic change from Mindhunter. Uh, being able to shoot black and white was amazing. Uh, I don't know how much I can say other, without giving anything away. It's just 
when we can talk about it, we will. But the black and white was incredible. If I could shoot black and white all the time, I would. It's, I loved it. It was fun. Yeah, it's it's fantastic. It was it was fun. We you know we definitely we were, uh, we were exploring the hard light you know way more than I think either of us had, had done in the past when we've worked together. And um, you know, it's the opportunity to go for it is, is pretty fun in that in that sphere. So yeah, it's, we look forward to showing it to people. These, we're grading it now. We're in the midst of the DI, so we're deep in it. But uh, but uh, looking forward to, to getting that one out there. Well, we're definitely looking forward to. It. I mean, the only piece of knowledge uh, that I have uh, is I know you guys continued your use of practicals. For certain, yeah. Bobby, uh, uh, tell us a little bit. I think you were pretty close to wrapping up uh, the second season on Mandalorian. And uh, what, what do you what do you have next in the bank when we get back to work? Uh, yeah, finished Mando. Um, unfortunately, my schedule didn't sync up right, and I didn't get to do that movie with Danny and Eric, unfortunately. Um, well, but, uh, you know, right now, <laughs> right, I, I, right now there's a lot of stuff in flux. I was, <laughs> I was prepping another movie um, that was sort of time dependent. Um, it was supposed to come out before a certain time, and with everything that's happened, I just don't know if it's going to resurface once... Uh, once this all settles. Well, we wish everyone good health. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I, I have to just, uh, you know, reiterate what Mike said. I mean, you guys, it's been an absolute pleasure having everybody with us today and we wish you continued health and continued sanity. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I know a lot of you guys are busy. There's been a lot of conversations and some great Zoom calls going on, uh, whether through uh, our outlet or 728 or a lot of stuff. So just, you know, continue to stay involved and keep in touch with your community and uh, your brothers and sisters out there. And uh, we will get back to some sort of normalcy. So uh, with that, I've got a couple things that um, I'd really like to plug. Uh, first up on the list is uh, our own Mike Bauman Gaffer to the Stars is hosting a live stream coming up here in just about an hour uh, over on uh, the Lux Lighting YouTube channel. They're going to be sitting down with Maddie Lee Batik and uh, Scotty Barnes, the board op, and Tana, the key grip, and going through Birds of Prey, uh, giving us a, a great viewpoint into some of the really interesting and cool things that they did on Birds of Prey. So we're absolutely happy to promote that. And uh, I encourage all of you to join us here uh, in the next hour on, uh, on the YouTube channel. Next week, uh, we'll be sitting down. We're going to go back to our Thursday time slot at 1030, and we're going to be sitting down uh, with Danny Durr. Gaffer and uh, Marcel Reeve uh, and talking about uh, Euphoria and talking about some of the wonderful and interesting style choices and technology that they're using on Euphoria. So I highly encourage you guys to keep an eye out for that and tune in. And so with that, I, again, I want to thank Eric so much. Thank you, Danny. Thank you, Bobby. Yeah. Really appreciate you guys spending the time with us today and I look forward to doing this again next time in person. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Pleasure. Yeah, thank right. you very thank much. You. Cheers.